we were talking about this cholesterol stuff and this is the thing that comes up all the time statins mm -hmm. uh, i know you've talked about it before but like again i'm really focusing on what my patients need to hear yeah Oh my yep. God, with these statins and these new injectable drugs trying to drive these LDLs down to 30 and convince, and, and here's the thing, patient, you know, when I talk to my cardiology consult, oh, well, here's the study and it reduces the risk of this. And I'm like, but there's other research that was not funded by the pharmaceutical industry. I understand that as of 2023, less than 3% of medical research is not funded by a drug company since the year 2000, I think it used to be like 30, 40% was, was not drug. Now it's all drug company studies. And I'm like, but look guys, there are people doing this work and the research suggests the exact opposite of what the drug companies. And then I'm like, remember what the drug companies have done. We've all seen it now. If you've been around for 20 years, you've seen them screw things up, manipulate people, get money. I'm not even gonna mention what just happened in the last few years. A perfect example of that, that opened many, many eyes. Don't wanna mention it for obvious reasons, but that was a perfect example. We could talk about antidepressants. We could talk about gabapentin. We can talk about Vioxx and, and the list just keeps keeps going. Bah, 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 bah. Drug company failing us to be honest with their research and giving us meaningful yeah. intervention. So that's the deal, you guys the statin guidelines and these other lipid lowering drugs are paid for by drug companies and manipulated aggressively. And it, it can you add to that? Cause th that's just, mm -hmm. I want to reinforce that idea that these statins have little to no benefit, maybe in a very, very sick population, but certainly not for primary prevention of disease and certainly not for elderly people whose brains are barely working and you need to make sure they have the cholesterol to operate their hormone system in their brain. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. There are multiple reasons to be very, very careful with statins. And you've mentioned some of them. Before I mention statins, I'll just riff for a moment on Please. one of the problems with American medicine. I believe that the American medical situation is among the best on the planet. Uh, as much as people here in the U.S. want to just destroy America and, you know, no one hates America like Americans do is something I've found. As a foreigner, I was born and raised in Canada and I've lived around the world, visited dozens of countries. It's a remarkable sort of a uniquely American attribute to think America is the worst at everything. Other countries don't feel that way. But nevertheless, one of the things we've done wrong that I think explains why our health come outcomes are not better is that we are one of – at least as of a few years ago, I think this is still the case. We're one of two countries in the world that allows drug companies to advertise. Um, so this is why we'll see watching a football game. I was just watching uh, a football game last night and there were m the majority of ads were for drug companies um, or a specific medication. And it, it is it is a remarkable environment where we then are we have a a, a, a patient who comes in and asks for a drug. You have a clinician who is in the U.S. nowadays um, needs to see more patients than ever, um, and so he, he or she can't take the time to talk about nutrition, and he there might not be a reimbursement code to get paid for talking about nutrition. And so there are all the incentives to not only make that visit as quickly as possible, but as a, a solution as simple as possible or seeming solution, that would be to leave with a prescription for a drug. Now, I am not of the mind that all drugs are bad and we should destroy the pharmaceutical industry. Not at all. Me neither. It is a, it is a miracle. Yeah, it is a miracle of modern science that we have some of these life-saving medications that we do have, and that work needs to continue, and we need the rest of the world to help make it happen by paying for the drugs that the U.S. is developing. This should not be a unique financial burden placed on Americans, um, and other countries are sort of let off the hook for that expense with them benefiting from these discoveries. So we need to continue the work, but not kid ourselves into picking a villain, uh, making a villain out of a marker just because we can target it. Now, what I just said actually has higher impact than I think most people realize. So I'll say that another way. A lot of the, wor many of the worst drugs exist because there is a there's something in the body that they target. And so let's for, take, for example, the statins. Statins have a horrific track record of actually improving health outcomes, actually making people live longer. It, it, they might not die from a heart attack, but they'll die from something else. Um, and just as likely, and, and their lifespan is 
probably not even remotely going to be extended and might even be much more miserable because of the statin. And I'll revisit that in a moment. But why even have a statin if its health, if its track record is so poor? Um, it's because we see that this medication will lower LDL cholesterol. So we have to make a villain of LDL cholesterol. If, for example, there is no drug that will really effectively target triglycerides. Triglycerides is a way better marker of heart disease risk than LDL cholesterol is. Why don't we ever talk about triglycerides? Because there's no triglyceride drug. If there were, then we'd be talking about this drug more. And just like glucose in the context of type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes isn't a glucose problem. It's an insulin problem. But because we have so many drug interventions that can lower glucose, glucose has become the marker that matters because it's a druggable target, whereas insulin isn't. You can't hide what insulin's doing. You have to address it head on. So that's that's largely my, that's at the heart of my frustration with using, uh, applying a pharmaceutical intervention to what is a lifestyle disease. It is, it, it is the food we eat that is the culprit or the cure. Any effort to try to mask the consequences of a bad lifestyle will only address specific symptoms while very often making the entire problem worse. Um, like, for example, back to diabetes, and then I'll come back to statins quickly. If we view type 2 diabetes as a disease of glucose, then we will, for example, say, let's just push up insulin really, really high in the type 2 diabetic because it will lower glucose, and it will. And if glucose were the only thing that mattered, then we would say we solved the problem. Unfortunately, it isn't. It's the high insulin that matters in the case of type 2 diabetes. That's what's making them sick, making them gain weight, making them have an increased dementia risk and fatty liver disease, et cetera, and heart disease, which is why, because it's insulin that matters, actually, if you put a type 2 diabetic on an insulin therapy, no clinical outcome improves. They get fatter and they get sicker. They're three times more likely to die from heart disease. They're twice as likely to get cancer, twice as likely to, um, to get dementia. We're making them fatter and sicker. Now, back to statins. Can I? We, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but if anyone is interested in really, really understanding what Dr. Bickman just said, please read Sickening by John Abramson. And there's this whole chapter on the story of insulin and how they did this and how they basically stuck type 2 diabetics on insulin and caused so much morbidity and mortality. And I spend countless hours in my clinic trying to get type two diabetics off Good insulin because it's Good insane to put any type two diabetic on insulin. I've had people come to my clinic with A1Cs of 11, 12, 15, unmeasurable. And if they make the dietary change, their insulins normalize. I mean, their A1Cs normalize and so do their fasting insulin. And so thank you, continue, sorry. Yeah. Well, in fact, just to put a fine point on that, uh, giving a type 2 diabetic insulin is like giving an alcoholic another glass of wine, hoping that that extra alcohol is going to solve the problem. When ironically and tragically, it's it, you're giving them more of the very thing that's caused the issue. So with statins, the evidence, I, mean, I would want the audience to know that the evidence is deeply conflicted. Uh, that the any mortality benefit that is ever claimed, even by drug-sponsored trials, it is always presented in a very deceiving may way, which is a relative risk, a relative risk. So if someone has a 1% chance of having a heart attack and you take that 1% chance and lower it down to a half of a percent, then we say oh my, there was a 50% reduction in heart disease risk. Well, what's the actual meaningfulness of reducing the risk of a heart attack from 1% to a half of a percent? I would say meaningful, that's nothing. But what's the consequence? Because there's a trade-off to declaring war on the body's ability to make cholesterol, which as we described it is a molecule of life. Well, for that half of a percent, which is how it actually should be presented in absolute terms, a half of a percent reduction in um, a heart attack, it, there could come with it a 50% increase in the risk, that would be a relative term, but uh, a dramatic increase in the risk of Alzheimer's disease or a dramatic increase in the risk of cancer or in type 2 diabetes, especially for women, statin therapy appears to be absolutely catastrophic. And, and I think, I don't want to say there should never be a place for statins because the work that I alluded to earlier with David Diamond and Paul Mason, we found that if a person has a high triglyceride to HDL ratio, that statins did appear to have a mortality benefit. But even then, I would say it would pale in comparison to changing diet. 
If you can improve your triglyceride to HDL ratio by changing your diet, you are going to have a much, much better uh, cardiovascular risk profile than any other thing you can do. So the, the, the evidence, again, just to wrap it up on statins is deeply problematic. It's very, very conflicted. Anyone who says otherwise is deliberately ignoring a mountain of evidence. And I think that overwhelmingly, if not every time, the negative consequences of the drug outweigh the possible benefit um, or the beneficial consequences. Uh, and this is, a, this is a fact of all drugs. You're putting something unnatural into your body. Um, it is just simply gonna be what happens now. And it'll be a balance. The person has to ask themselves, are the consequences I want worth the consequences I don't want? And in the case of statins, I think overwhelmingly that balance is tipped to the negative. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that, because uh, you mentioned, is there any role for statins? I don't believe there's any role for statins in primary prevention of disease. Well I, I think agree completely. that is like the key. Now, when you have sick patients that are not even going to ever listen to this podcast, are never going to change their bread, butter, desserts, cereals, orange juice, all this nonsense that they've been consuming for 70 years, by all means, give them whatever drugs, because that's the system we have. You're not going to convince them otherwise. And I don't know. Like, I don't know. But especially if they've had an event before. Yeah. I mean, so I like that you called out a primary because it does appear to have a much more substantial benefit in the case of a secondary. secondary yeah. Where if someone has had a heart attack, a statin does appear to reduce the risk of a subsequent heart attack. But also, I mean, maybe just to make a diplomatic conclusion to my thoughts, if you are worried... Put all of your blood tests on the shelf for a moment and go in and get a coronary artery calcium scan. Um, a really well done study looked at the overall mortality benefit and found that cholesterol levels didn't matter at all. Um, you could have people high or low cholesterol if they had no calcified um, calcifications in the coronary artery. There was no lifestyle, um, there no, no mortality benefit whatsoever to the statin. And once again, regardless of their cholesterol levels, if the person had a higher score of calcification in the coronary artery, then statins did appear to have a mortality benefit. So all the more reason not to base the decision on whether statins are used on a clinical, on a, on a blood marker, but rather actually do a scan and just look at the state of the heart and in, I in reality, rather than a surrogate. And I would add to it, like you could look at the full metabolic panel, a really common issue that comes up is, is patients that had a heart attack five, 10 years ago, and they've really changed their lifestyle. And they also removed the in, insults, the, the, what I consider yeah. the triggers. So something you recently posted, and I think is just so important is the role of stress in metabolic disease, heart disease. Now, this is not new information that Dr. Bickman shared because when I was in medical school and I was le learning about the Framingham Heart Study and, and all of these basic re research that drives uh, our recommendations, stress was the second risk factor for having a heart attack. So they already knew that from studies long, long, long ago, uh, obviously smoking, right? So one of the considerations here is when you have a patient that had a terrible disease, but then removed the smoking, removed the stress, cleaned up their diet, their, their metabolic pattern is cleaned up. I think that's a time to remove the statin, especially when they're older, over 65, they made those changes over the last 10, 15 years, they're in better shape. By all means, don't go into your golden years sub suppressing your cholesterol production, increasing your risk for dementia and the like. And, and that's like this tricky one that I wanted to bring up with you on because, yes, I think we both agree. Primary prevention, no role. I don't I, ca I can't see an argument when we're like sick people. There's a lot of arguments. The, the data is all over the place. It's very, very hard to say someone who removed the initial triggers and has done the lifestyle has done the work should not then suppress their cholesterol production because of a number i think that's wild and crazy and i battle all the time about this yeah yeah that that is one of the what's interesting though about talking about statins is i have a, a host of physician friends that live near byu here in utah that that are all in they see things the way we see them they're all in they are deprescribing anti-diabetic medications, anti-hypertensive medications just every day. But every one of them says, I just am really reluctant to take them off the statin. And that is born completely from a fear of litigation. Yeah. 
it's just this this off chance that someone has a heart attack and then it is found out that they had deprescribed a statin that right. physician's life is ruined you know their their career is just going to be tanked and so that it is the statin that we we are just so enamored we have been so convinced of its utility that we can't that even when we know everything we know and i'm i'm sympathetic to the fact that i don't have that same litigation right. risk because i'm a professor um not a physician but that is the one that 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 idea is so deep seated that we're it, it's hard to it's hard to point the finger at the statin. And I'll just add, the most lucrative drug of all time is Lipitor and continues to be and is more lucrative than like the next three drugs combined. So let's not forget that. And then the other part is based on current guidelines, something like seventy or eighty percent of the population would be a candidate for these drugs. Wow. I'm sorry, there is no there is, that that is not possible. You cannot. I mean, unless everyone's eating seed oils and carbs, right? We got it. Yep.